Hey, I'm Bob and I like to make stuff. Today on Maker 101, we're just gonna barely dip our toes in Fusion 360. I have not done a Maker 101 video in quite a while, so if you're not familiar with this, this is not really a project video. It's about introducing a new skill to somebody who may not have any experience with it. If you already know anything about Fusion, this one's gonna be pretty simple and probably not very interesting to you. But if you've never used Fusion before and you're curious about it, hopefully this will help you get started. Okay, first off, what is Fusion? Fusion 360 is a 3D modeling application and it's made by Autodesk. It is a paid program, but there are free versions of it. You can get a free license if you're a hobbyist or you're a student. So there's really no reason for you not to download it, install it, and get started. I will say as a whole, the application is extremely big. The learning curve is a little bit high and it can do a lot of stuff but you don't necessarily have to learn all of it to make it useful for you. And in this case, we're just gonna talk about how to use it for some 3D printing. There are lots and lots of great tutorials out there that will give you information about every single one of the tools, all the different features that it has, and I really urge you to go look at those once you get more comfortable. This is really just about using it for the first time to make something practical. All right, let's get into it. Not too long ago on YouTube, I made this. It's a short trooper helmet and it's fully 3D printed. I modeled this in Fusion 360. In that video, I showed some really fast images of the modeling process, but I didn't show all of it because honestly, it was 40 or 50 hours of modeling time. I just didn't record it all. But since I put that video up, a lot of people were curious about how that modeling process actually worked. I'm not gonna jump into something that big for this first video. Instead, we're gonna start with something much smaller. So lately on my Twitch stream, I've been working on this. This is the blaster rifle that goes with that short trooper costume. One of the concerns that a lot of people have when you're making props like this is that it doesn't have an orange tip. In the context of a Comic-Con or when you're in costume, having the tip on here is probably not that big of a deal, but it really depends on the rules of the event that you're at. So it's never bad just to have one as a precaution. And in this case, we're gonna model one that fits on this gun, but we can easily take it off when it's not needed. The first step to model something to fit around something in the real world is to measure the object. In this case, I'm gonna use some digital calipers. The ones I have are really inexpensive. I got them from Harbor Freight, and they are just precise enough to work really well in this case. Essentially, I just measured all the dimensions for this object. I got how big around it was, how tall it was, and where the pieces needed to sit relative to each other. Now we'll jump into Fusion and turn those dimensions into a model. Depending on the units that you're used to working in, you can easily set this to Imperial or Metric. I just left it as the standard, it doesn't really matter to me. But you can easily change it depending on what model you're working on. Once I had that set, I went into Sketches. Sketches are 2D drawings that you make in Fusion that you use to create 3D objects. I started from a center point on a plane and made a circle. From that same center point, I drew another circle and just made it a little bit bigger. There are different types of circles that you can draw in Fusion, but I started with the center point and then drug outward. A little box pops up, you can put in the actual dimensions that you need for the circle, and then it just draws it to that size. Once I had both of these drawn with the same center point, there was an area where they overlapped. That overlap area is what I actually want to use to create the object. I selected that and used push-pull to extrude it into a 3D object. At this point, I just made a tube. I set the height, also with a number input based on the height that I had measured with my calipers before. I drew a smaller circle, again centered with all of these other circles, and this one is the size of the inside of the barrel. This will be the little insert that goes inside the barrel to hold this cap in place. I extruded this in the opposite direction as before. Note that this sketch is actually on top of my cylinder, not at the base like the other ones were. Then I just needed to fill in the top of this. I grabbed the sketch from the list on the left, all of them show up over there. I grabbed the sketch that I wanted and then extruded it up a little bit. This made a solid cap covering all of the work that I had done so far. You have some really simple tools like chamfer and fillet that you can add some nice details to around edges. In this case, I used chamfer to round over the edge. Using the orbit tool, you can look around your 3D object in all directions and from here you can see exactly what we've got so far. This is just a few minutes of work, but it's actually enough to be able to pop onto the gun as it is. The list on the left is a list of everything that you've created, both solid three-dimensional bodies and two-dimensional sketches. You can select things from the list and select copy and make a duplicate of it. So I made a duplicate of this body and then looked at the bottom side of it so I could modify it from there. I use the selection tool to grab the bottom ring of this 3D solid and then use the press pull tool to push it up. I want to make the second one of these caps shorter than the first one. You can do this by putting in a number or just drag the arrow in the direction that you want it to go. 
Just about every one of these tools that you select creates a little pop-up window on the screen which gives you input boxes and specific information you can set about these actions. At this point, there's no specific need to add a material or a color to these objects, but it can make it easier to look at and help you understand what you're doing. You can drag the materials to the objects so that they render differently. You can set the specific color. There's a lot of options, and they do have certain purposes later on when you get further in the modeling process. In this case, I just wanted to show that that's where the tool is, and you can use it. I use the Move tool to take the smaller one of these down to the same plane as the larger one. Then I went into the sketch editor and drew a rectangle that just intersected both of these objects. Again, I used press pull to extrude this sketch. This created a third body that bridged the gap between the two main cylinders. In the pop-up menu there, you have an operation with lots of different options, and by creating a new body, it doesn't interfere with the two existing bodies that it's intersecting. Another really handy tool is Insert SVG. This lets you bring in a 2D SVG graphic into your model as a sketch. It puts it in the sketch editor, and from there you can treat it like any other shape. I rotated it around, placed it on the cylinder where I wanted it, and then changed the view so that I could extrude it. Each one of these pieces is a separate sketch, so I grabbed all of them, used the press pull tool to lift it up to a height that seemed reasonable. If I wanted to, I could also push it down and it would create a cavity, it would actually subtract that shape from the existing shape below it. At this point, the model was pretty much done. It's extremely simple, but it was ready for 3D print. Using the Make menu in Fusion 360, I sent it directly to my slicing software, which is Cura. I didn't do anything special to it here. I just set normal quality and sent it to the printer. The grid on the inside of this model is actually support material that's added by Cura. This helps the final piece that you want come out at good quality by creating a temporary structure inside of it or underneath it. Support material is intentionally thin and pretty easy to pull out. It's just there for the printing process, not for the process after the fact. I use some needle nose pliers to grab chunks of it, twist it, it breaks right off. If you need a good finish on your final model, you need to be pretty careful about where you put this because it does leave little bits of residue where the print was attached to the support material. As you get experience with 3D printing, you learn a lot more about the orientation of your models and how that affects where the support material goes and the final quality of your finished pieces. Depending on which material you're using, there are lots of different ways to finish up your final 3D print. That's an entire video by itself. Once I got this one all cleaned up, it was ready to try out on the gun. On the first print that I did, I actually didn't let it complete on purpose. There's no reason to waste material and waste time just to figure out if it fits. In this case, I stopped the print early because all I really need to know right off the bat is if these are the right size and they are in the right position relative to each other. And it's good that I did that because they were actually a little bit too far apart. I went back to the model and I moved this one up just a hair and then printed it again. After all that was removed, I ended up with this final piece. The quality that you want to use to print this is really dependent on the object. In this case, it's a simple cover, so I don't really need a lot of fine detail. I made the build lines a little bit thicker so it would print faster. But the print lines don't have anything to do with how it should fit. It slides right on there and snaps into place. So now that I have that on there, I can take this around and people will understand that this is a prop, it's a toy, it's not a real gun because I've got that on there. And then when I get this back to my house and I wanna display it with my other props, this pops right off and it's good to go. So that is your super basic introduction to Fusion 360. I hope you realize that even though it's big and it's powerful, you can get started with something small. If you've got some other topics that you'd like me to cover in Maker 101, leave them down in the comments. I've got lots of other projects that you might be interested in, and I'll be back later this week with another project video. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.